All right. Praise the Lord. Be not conformed to the world, but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And there's a renewing of the minds, and there's always speaking of things that, even though we know, we, we bring them to remembrance. So as I was sitting, I had a few things come to my remembrance, uh, and I'll, I'll, start, I'll start with that. Um, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So there is an issue of... Uh, Neglect or hesitating or tarrying or putting things off or putting it afar off. Uh, the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So in times of, as I've been saying the last few weeks, in times of when things get polarized and people's uh, opinions and stands get uh, more pronounced and passionate and militant, <laughs> then we're going to see more... We, we won't be able to sit, to, to sit on a fence as Christians, right? So we can't sit on a fence. We'll have to make some kind of decision. We'll be pressed into it. Um, the Word of God is quick and powerful. I'll give you an example. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. and pier- It pierces through to the, the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It's a, it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, through through neglect, mine, everybody's, the church's neglect, the church's slumber, the church's uh, neglect in promoting judgment, true, true righteous judgment, the, the church is the salt, and the salt has lost its savor. Because the church doesn't want to make definitive, absolute judgments and make certain stands on what is righteous. You know, you could look at it in, on many fronts. On the obvious, some of the more obvious fronts are the... Uh, Issues of sexuality, let's say. I was watching YouTube, uh, or skimming through some YouTube things and looking at all the preachers who will, who will just skirt the homosexuality. They won't say it's right or wrong. They don't want to ruffle any feathers. They want to sit on the fence. You know, now if the church has savor, they'll make the definitive judgment that it is wrong. <laughs> it's not natural. Now definitively make that stand. But the preachers aren't doing that. A lot of preachers aren't. But things are going to polarize. Now, when the Word of God becomes pure and it's uh, applied properly, it defines things. It starts to uh, define some things that are absolute. And uh, we know that our generation has lost a lot of its sort of absolutes. Uh, things People think that morality and values and ethics are sort of subjective. It depends on how you see it or how you see it. But there are some absolutes. And absolutes, uh, to help define absolutes, you can look at nature, right? Nature. So if something is natural, if something is uh, ungodly, it's unnatural. So like on the issue of homosexuality. The homosexual act is physiologically unnatural. It doesn't have a purpose. It's the wrong places fitting together. It doesn't accomplish anything. Nature, nature itself tells you that the human body has certain parts and they have certain functions. So certain parts of the body are functional for procreating life. Other parts of the body have nothing to do with procreating life, if you see what I'm saying. And I won't, get, I won't go past there. But that's nature confirming the perverseness of homosexuality. Okay, so those are absolutes. Now, the Word of God. uh, In one place in the book of Acts, I don't know if it was Stephen, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think it was. Stephen's preaching the Word of God, and the Word of God cut them to their heart. And they turned on Stephen, and they attacked him, and they gnashed on him with his teeth. Now, up until that point, there was no word of God being spoken. But what the word of God did is the word of God polarized them. The word of God put them to an extreme. So they turned and they rejected it outrightly, militantly, viciously, murderously. Gnashed on him with their teeth and stoned him with stones until he died. Well, that didn't happen until the word of God came out. <laughs> if the word of God isn't coming out, if the Word of God isn't clear, if it's not pure, if it's not being preached in its purity and its power and by the Holy Ghost, then everyone can sit on the fence and sort of get along or whatever. But now Stephen comes and preaches the Word of God and indicts the Jews, brings 
uh, sinful guiltiness, blood guiltiness of Jesus upon him. You know that's what the man of God did, right? He said, Jesus Christ, who you with wicked hands have slain and crucified, you, you did it, your sin put him on the cross. You're guilty of the death of Jesus. They brought the blood guiltiness on him. Why? To condemn him? No, so they could have an opportunity to be sorry and repent. <laughs> right? But still, I'm just talking about polarization. So here's the word of God. Stephen preaches it and it cut to their heart. Just rubbed them the wrong way. And now, that was to the people who were proud and religious and uh, whatever, carnal. But to the people who had humility, Peter preaches the word of God does the same thing, brings the blood guiltiness of Christ upon them, and they were pricked in their heart. They were pricked. I said, oh my goodness, men, are, what must we do to be saved? How do we, how do we remedy this? How do we get right with God? You see, there's an a, a evident humility there. And this is what the purity of God's Word does. Gradually, as the Word of God becomes revealed to a nation or an individual, you're either going to gnash with your teeth and kill and stone and hate the Christians... Or you're going to be humbled and you're going to say, oh my goodness, what do I have to do to get saved? And there's not going to be a, there's not going to be a middle fence-sitting position. So I like to say hot or cold. So when things are too sort of lukewarm in the middle for too long, God allows all this to happen. All right, so that's... <laughs> looking for my glasses. So anyway... One of the things that's uh, foundational to salvation, there's many things you could come uh, at this issue with, absolutes. Well, one of the absolutes is that you can't do anything in Christianity until you have humility. And I spent a, quite a few weeks um, describing the relationship of submission, faith, charity, and humility. Uh, I'll review it quickly, okay? You know, the, the, the story of the... People who Jesus said, I haven't found so great faith. No, the people with the greatest faith of the Bible was the Syrophoenician woman. Help my daughter. She's grievously vexed with the devil. Can't take children's bread and give it to the dogs. Truth, Lord, but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Or have not found so great faith. Not in Israel. Be it unto thee even as, as you will. Well, what was her... What, was, uh, what, was, what, what, what made the faith so great? Well, first of all, Jesus called her a dog. It didn't cut her to the heart. She didn't strike back. No. Say, you nasty man, why are you calling me names for? No, she didn't say that. She had, what did she have? She had humility. Truth, Lord, I'm a dog. Yeah. <laughs> Truth, Lord, I'm a sinner. You're a great God, and I'm just a low sinner. Right? Humility. You can't repent without humility. Exactly. You can't repent without humility. You can't have faith, true faith without humility. You can't have charity without humility. So she was, she had humility. And then the the uh, centurion soldier, you know, my son and my servants are sick and ready to die, and I'll come and heal him. Jesus says, he says, no, Lord, I am not worthy. Humility, see, right off the bat, first thing you see, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Second thing, just speak the word only, and my servant will be healed, because I am a man under authority. And I have soldiers under me. And he begins to explain. And I say to this man, go and he goes. And I say to this man, come and do that. And he does that. And whatever I say, they have to accomplish. And I recognize, Jesus, you're the authority. And whatever you say has to be accomplished. So you don't even have to come to my house. And I'm not even worthy that you should come here. Just speak the word only. Amen. So he was full of humility, full of, un full of submission. He understood submission as one being authority. And he understood submission as one being under authority. He understood it from both sides of the issue. And he related it to the authority of Jesus and was able to have great faith in Jesus. So much faith that he didn't even need him to come into the house. Just speak the word. So you have all this uh, coming together of principles. Uh, humility, submission, charity. Charity is love. And love and submission are related in the uh, statement of Jesus. If you love me, keep my commandments or submit to my commandments. So why would you submit to a commandment? Because you love. Uh, submission is a, a willing, it's a voluntary laying down of the will in preference to somebody else's will. You lose your life to fulfill the life of, of, of another. You forego your image and your desire and your accomplishments to accomplish something of, of someone greater than yourself. Submission. 
We can't neglect salvation. Well, I was talking about how the Word of God, it either cuts you to the heart or it pricks you and convicts you. So it either produces a proud, militant, murderous, gnashing, vicious response or it humbles you and says, you know, what must I do to be saved? As the Word of God becomes revealed more and more, it, 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 it'll tend to do one or the other. And it's a two-edged sword. So it brings me to the next, uh, next issue here. I'm going to deviate from my notes for a little bit because um, I'm thinking of other things. Uh, the, uh, the Christian church is the salt of the earth. As we carry the testimony of Jesus both in word and in deed, uh, we become a spirit of prophecy. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, um, I don't necessarily have to go door to door and tell everybody that the world is being destroyed and we have to forsake the world and we have to work out our salvation and a man must be saved and we have to repent of our sins and the whole world lies in wickedness and we need to separate out of that world and work out, work out our salvation. I could say that in words or I could just begin to withdraw from the activities of the world and the people who know, know me will see, see the change of my life, the course of my life and they'll, it, it'll be demonstrated to them without me saying anything. For example, you know, as a young man, I was trying to be a, an aspiring rock and roll star. And so then when I got saved, you know, God showed me that, uh, not only, that I had to get out of that whole lifestyle. It's all, you know, drugs and heavy metal music is just uh, inundated with the spirit of rebellion, the spirit of suicide, the spirit of vulgarity, all kinds of perversions and all occult and the whole rock world is full of that. Never mind the words to the songs. The music itself is inherently distorted. I mean, I, we would turn up our guitars and deliberately get a distorted, a distorted guitar sound. Not a natural guitar sound, a distorted, in other words. So everything about it was not righteous. So I began to sanctify myself according to the commandment of God and my understanding of God's Word as I learned the Word of God. So all my friends who were thought I could be a, a guitar player of notoriety or something. Maybe I could make it to the big times. They, they see me abandon those ambitions. They see me abandon them. Now, I haven't said anything to them. I just abandoned that pursuit. I start pursuing holiness, seeing what God wants me to do. And they say, well, Jonathan, he's wasting his life. He's such a talented <laughs> guitar player. Why did he stop? Like, he's really, really good. He had a real shot at this. And uh, he became one of those religious quacks. Praise God. So... What is it doing? It's, it's a spirit. It's a spirit. There's a manifestation happening in their conscience. They're seeing it. I haven't said a word to them. I haven't said a single word to them. And yet, the testimony of my, how I am repenting and getting out of the evils of this world are speaking to them. And it's making them consider my religious, quote-unquote, fanaticism. During which time, there's a manifestation in their conscience that reminds them about what all those fanatical Christians are saying about the Lord's coming back and blah, blah, blah. And see, so it's, uh, the manifestation is made to their conscience. There's a spirit of prophecy. The events of my life, the Holy Spirit can take the events of my life and witness something to the conscience of another man. Touch who's not. And it becomes a spirit of prophecy. Now, it's not that we're without uh, utterance. We also say it. We also say it. But um, there is a... Witness. As a matter of fact, to this day, the last time I went back to Canada, I, I hear reports that some of my old musician friends and back in those days, uh, they, uh, they shun me and don't have anything to do with me. And they're saying all kinds of these evil, vicious things against me about my religious stand. And I, I, I have no idea. They've been saying this for the last 20, 30 or 40 years. And there's been this growing stigma or... Uh, Rumor about what I'm doing and what kind of manner of man I'm at. I'm at. And, well, they don't. They have never seen me. They haven't talked to me in 40 years. Where are they? Where are they coming up with this? But there must be some kind of witness of my lifestyle that somehow contributed to their right. opinion of me. So ultimately, then that's a good thing. That somehow, without me saying a word to them, my lifestyle has some kind of effect on their conscience. Absolutely. Okay, so it's a spirit of prophecy. So don't underestimate the great work that the Holy Ghost can do to the conscience of men, even though we're just sitting here separated as the people around us watch us perfect our holiness and our separation in the fear of God. No. Yes, we are wasting our life. Yeah, we're not wasting our life, of course. Amen. Now, 
the uh, lots of people like to identify with Jesus Christ, and and um, a lot of people like to identify with the power of Jesus Christ. They like to be, and I'm not saying there's anything inherently wrong with this, but they want to be the person that prays and watches someone else get healed, or they want to pray and watch someone else get delivered. And the power of God works through us as individuals for that. And that is legitimate. And so there is a there is different aspects of Jesus' life. Jesus is the, the Lord that heals. He is the Lord that delivers you. He is the Lord that uh, redeems you and sanctifies you. He is the Lord that gives you peace. And in the book of Peter it says they deny they deny the Lord that bought them. See, no one's going to deny the Lord that will give you a benefit. I'm not going to deny the Lord says, hey, you want a deliverance? <laughs> sure. You want to be blessed? <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, would you like some peace in your heart? Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. You know, Would you like to be healed of your disease? <laughs> yes, I would. I'm not going to deny any of that. I mean, it's just the natural thing to re- not to deny something that's a benefit for you or something that could be a benefit to someone else. But how about the Lord that bought you? Hebrews says, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Consider the apostle and the high priest. I always point out that it says apostle and high priest for a reason, and it says it in that order for a reason. Now, Jesus, when he was on earth 2,000 years ago, was an apostle. He was an apostle. And the work he did 2,000 years ago was the work that purchased us back. And what purchased us back? was the crucifixion. When Jesus was an apostle, that's where he suffered. That's where he bore his cross. Right? That's where he went and, and took on the sin of the whole world, was crucified. It was his apostleship that, was, uh, that had all that intensity about it so that in the garden he, he was facing the crucifixion and, and all that he had to do to buy us back from, from the devil's domain and uh, he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass and all of that. That is the apostle, the work he did on earth. Consider what he did, all of that. Consider that he was a man despised, rejected of men. Because, you know, the Bible is telling us to pick up our cross. Yeah, I'm despised by my old friends. I'm despised by certain religious people. I'm despised by, in a lot of ways, by my own kinfolk. And so are you, if you're a Christian. Consider the apostle. Consider the suffering aspects. Consider those you have to identify with the Jesus who is willing to suffer reproach and shame for making his stand with God. The apostles, right? Even the other apostles, they had to suffer what? Reproach. They couldn't be accepted and loved by everybody. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Now, before the uh, disciples were filled with the Holy Ghost and before they were converted, he said, the world can't hate you, but me it hates But then afterwards, when they got the Holy Ghost and they became apostles instead of just disciples, John says it in 1 John and one of the other Gospels says it. He says says to his own disciples or his own apostles, don't don't marvel if the world hates you. You If they kept my saying, they'll keep yours. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. A servant's not greater than his master. If they hated the master, you're not greater that they should love you and hate the master. No, because if they hated the master going to hate you too. You're carrying the same message. You're carrying the same divine nature. You're, you're portraying the same image. You got the same counsel. If they hated him, they hate you. And, and like he said, if I had not come to them and not spoken unto them, they had not sinned, but now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. So that's part of it. That's part of apostleship. That's part of discipleship. That's part of Christian, as I said before, you have to identify with his suffering. You have to identify with his death. As I was talking about baptism and uh, the symbolism of baptism as it's portrayed in the book of Leviticus in the system of animal sacrifices, any man who had to sacrifice a, a lamb or an animal for a sin, which represented Jesus Christ, our sacrifice, he had to put his hand, the individual who sinned, had to put his hand on the head of the sacrifice. He had to identify himself with the death of the sacrifice. Are you going to let your life be something that someone can compare it to the crucified, the death of Jesus, the apostle? Now, Jesus as a high priest, after he suffered, God raised him from the dead and highly exalted him to become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
So the high priesthood is a, is a position of glory and honor and power. And the high priesthood is the one who bestows, you know, the gifts and the benefits and the blessings and the high priest does that. So when you're considering Jesus Christ, don't just consider the high priest. You consider the apostle and the high priest. The apostleship representing a life on earth of picking up your cross, suffering, reproach, shame, rejection, denying yourself, struggling through your working out of your salvation, trials, tests, tribulations. And then, but don't just consider that because you'll get discouraged if all you see is, is suffering. <laughs> consider the exaltation that's coming, the joy that's set before you. God highly exalted him, he'll highly exalt you. If you suffer with him, you'll reign with him. If, if you suffer with him, pick up your cross, you will be glorified with him. So you've got to consider them both. But as you consider the apostleship and picking up your cross, denying yourself, suffering shame, uh, he was despised, reproached, rejected of men. This is the stone which the builders rejected, disallowed by men, but chosen of God, elect and precious. You now, when the world rejects you, God receives you. What did God choose? Foolish things of the world. The base things of the world. The things the world despises. The world that the, 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 thing, the world that re rejects. God chooses, chooses those things to shame the world in, in its position of their own understanding and their own wisdom and arrogance and, arrogance and proud of their accomplishments. And, you know, people are, are so enthralled and they're so proud of mankind. Oh, we've gone to outer space and we've done this and it, it's so puny compared to the power of God. I'm sure God just sits back and laughs at it. Yes. And people get all, all oppressed. Oh, hey, I got to... Uh, and I know friends of mine who, who got to uh, go, go to a concert and I got a picture with Elton John. And, oh, oh, I met the governor. Oh, I, get, I got to sit down and have a, have a chat with the vice president. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not impressed. <laughs> we come, hey, we come here every Sunday... Every Sunday we come here and Jesus Christ, the King of Glory, is standing right in our midst. You can't beat that one. Well, I, don't care, I don't care who you meet of notoriety in the world. It's no comparison, right? I'm not impressed. Anyway, so this is what we're dealing with. Uh, so here's, here's what I'm getting at. Uh, it's all, all that to say this, get to get to the scripture, to illustrate it. Now, 2 Corinthians 2, 15, 16, and 17. Here's what I'm getting at. We all want to, uh, all of us like to be accepted and be at peace and, and so on. And, and so we should strive to be like that with one another, especially within the church. And I know the Bible says, as much as lies in you, as much as is possible, be at peace with all men. That's right. I'm telling you, there's certain conditions sometimes where you can't, you no. cannot be. But, but you, as an individual, try as hard as you can, yeah. take peaceableness as far as you can take it. That's right. You should always do that. Right. So, uh, but we're, it's, an impo it's impossible to be a Christian without being some sort of offense to somebody somewhere. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to offend the transgender or the homosexual, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transgress the uh, religious spirit, the spirit of religious whoredom. So I'm going uh, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna offend I'm not going to try, it. but you don't try to offend. You don't do it deliberately. You don't have intention to offend. That's, the Bible says, "Be not many masters. Do not try to be many big men of authority or like in many things. Don't be not many masters because in many things we offend all. We offend all people who have to stand up and be spokesmen for God. People who have to stand up and and as the Bible says, if any man speaks, let him speak as the oracle of God. Oh, really?" So when you get up and speak, if God ordains it for you, or if I get up and speak as a minister or a teacher, I have to consider I am God's mouthpiece. That's, that's what the Bible says. Now that could be a lofty thing, or it could be a thing of humility. But the thing is, is that that is the weightiness of it. If I am God's mouthpiece, then what's God going to do? Well, God, God has a controversy with his people. God says to his ministers, his teachers, his pastors, evangelists, prophets, he's so all my people are transgressions. He's making indictments through the mouth of, of people. And now those people too, they're really under the gun because now if they make the indictment as the oracle of God but they don't live up to the standard, they get, they get beat down by God worse than you, you do. They really get it. In fact, so bad we see God took, a few, took men out, men of great men of, considered great men of God, God took them out, killed them. 
I've seen it happen two or three times in the last few years. Men who had great position and stature in front of many people and yet could not, did not live the standard or did not uh, follow through on a testimony, God took them out. So that's a fearful thing. As Christians, we have an effect. That's the whole thing. The salt has lost its fa- savor or the Christian lifestyle has no more effect on the world. Because it doesn't have judgment, it doesn't have holiness, it doesn't have purity. People don't treat it as important as they should, or they neglect. And I'm going to get to this neglect thing, because that was the biggest issue that I had sitting down here before we started. Second Corinthians 2.15 For we are unto God, the Christians, we are unto God, a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish. We are a savor, we have a taste, we have an effect we have something that, that people notice about us. That's right. right? I mean, if something has, if you have a food that has more robust flavor, then you notice it more, right? It has more of an effect on you. Absolutely. You know, if I eat an apple with no, no taste in it, and I'll kind of chew the apple and it'll have a texture, and I'll, I'll look puzzled because I thought, I'm thinking I should taste something, and there's not very much taste in this apple. And so, yeah, I have this puzzled look, but... But if the, if the apple is full of sweetness and vibrant flavor and, and robust, I have a reaction. Right? So we, we are a savor to, to them that are saved, and we are a savor to them that perish. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death. And to the other, we are the savor of life unto life. So what's the effect we have on each other as brethren when we come together, fellowship? I mean, even if we expose each other's faults, it's only for the sake of correction and repentance and restoration and to the perfecting of holiness and getting going on further with the Lord. That's, that's life. Praise the Lord. Or if, it's, if it has God. nothing to do with sin or correction or our faults, it's so that we can encourage one another and build up one another. As the Bible says, this is a fitly framed building and the, the body gives increase of itself. It edifies itself in the love of God as we share and commune and share our faith and communicate. Uh, God's Spirit is right there with us, giving the increase. Helping us grow. So we're the savor of life. I, I, I come away from fellowship with, with hope, with a more feeling of life, more, more confidence that I can go on with God. I can go over, have fellowship with my brothers, and I can be discouraged, and the brother will wash my feet. Said, no, brother, God's still with you. Go, you know, Be encouraged, brother, and go on in the faith, and God be with you, and we're the savor of life to each other. But to the world, what are we the savor of? We're the savor of death. Yeah. Oh, there's those doom and gloom guys. I don't like being around them. They think, they, think you're, they, they want me to waste my life and leave my family and whatever they say. You understand? Because you're testifying that whatever you do in life is vain if you don't work out your salvation. What is it, like I said last week, and as we all know, well know, what, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What, what, hap- what, would, be, what would profit me to be the, the, the greatest, su- most successful, most widely known and revered rock guitarist in modern history? Because in a hundred years, nobody will even remember who I am. Hardly. Yeah. And then I die, and then what? You bring, do we be, believe the Bible? You bring nothing into the world, you carry nothing out. And when you die, as Ecclesiastes says, everything you've done in life, all your accomplishments, all your love, all your hatred, all your envy, all your emotions, all your everything you've done in life, it's done. It's gone. You're in the grave. You ever think of that? I mean, what's, what happens when you die? It's over. It's all vanity. If, if, you're not, if you're not in Christianity for the eternal purpose, if you're not looking at this in reference to the eternal purpose, in other words, all this is is a testing preparation platform so I can get prepared to meet God so I can have glory with God eternally and that all this is not just some some God who is a masochist who just gets his kicks out of watching us suffer all this suffering is very necessary to teach our hearts not to go against God in eternity it's a necessity because we know who went against God in eternity right Lucifer God had his little rebellious problem in heaven there, iniquity with Lucifer. And now, God is dealing with that whole transgression, iniquity, rebellion. He's going to perfect the people that will not rebel. Why will we not rebel? 
Because we had our little taste of rebellion down here. We had our encounter with sin. And we've suffered because of sin. And those experiences write indelibly on the table of our heart that, boy, we have to submit. We cannot go against God. We must stay true to God. Because it's a necessity. It has to be that way. If we don't, we will defile, we'll contribute to the defilement of the entire realm of eternity. And of course, God won't have that. He'll just, anything that defiles, He will cast out. As I said, don't think of God as a... Well, we, we don't, by and large here, we don't. But people in their carnal minds, they think of God as malicious. They, they always argue, well, if He's such a loving God, why does He cause so much suffering? Well, we can go down those theological arguments all day long. Who said God was causing it anyway? God gave man will. God has been reaching and wooing and calling and demonstrating and warning man for the last 6,000 years. And man has just ignored it. Gone his own way. And this is the, the natural cause and effects consequence of people neglecting and ignoring God. Don't put that on God. <laughs> right? Don't put it on God. So, we are the savor. To ourselves, we're the savor of life unto life. To the lost, we are the savor of death. We remind them of destruction. We remind them of the judgment of God. We remind them of hellfire. We remind them. And they don't like that. They despise that. So as a Christian, this is the problem that, that we have as, as, as human beings. We want to be everybody's friend. We would like to get along with everybody. <laughs> but if you're a Christian, you're going to rub people the wrong way. Not because you mean to, but you are going to. You're going to be a saver of death. And see, and so the Christian, Christians struggle with having to be the saver of death to somebody. I'm such a saver of death to my kinfolk that my kinfolk will rise up and they'll, uh, I've learned not to give my pearl to them anymore. Because they just turn around and tear me up. And they do, they tear me up. They gnash at me of my teeth quite literally. Why? Because every time I try to say something or testify, it's bearing witness against them. And they, they don't like that. So, we have to be willing to be a saver of death. We, we can't carry the unrealistic expectation that we get along with everybody. Even though our intent is not to offend, we know we will offend. In many things, we offend all. To the one we are the saver of death unto death, to the other the saver of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? So, you know, I would love to identify with Jesus as a man who comes and lays hands and you get healed and lay hands on you and you get delivered and I pray a blessing upon you and you get a million dollars in the mail or whatever. Because if, if I identify with Jesus, if, if, if I identify with Jesus like that, hey, everybody loves me, right? Oh, thank you. Thank you for the blessing. Oh, I'm so thankful I got healed. I thank, thank you. But are, are you going to identify with the Lord that bought you? So, and this is, this is characteristic of a lot of manifestations of the Holy Ghost and the the religious spirit. Now, there's a lot of things that come into play here. Jesus, uh, the, the, the disciples said, uh, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and he, he didn't follow us. He was separated from us. He wasn't a part of us. But they're casting out devils in your name. And Jesus says, well, just let them be, because no man can lightly speak evil of me if they're casting out a devil in my name. So just, it, it, you know, it's, so just let them go ahead. But the fact is, they were not a part of them. They were not a part. There are people who say, Lord, we cast out devils in your name. We healed the sick. We did this. You taught in our streets. We prophesied. We preached. We did all this stuff in your name. And he says, I don't know you. You, you weren't one of us. It's a part. You're working iniquity. So we really got to be on our toes and understand that that stuff is out there. But by and large, what motivates us is that everybody wants to identify with the great glorious manifestation of the high priest. Because... You know, everybody loves a high priest. Everybody loves him that gives gifts. If I, all I do is pray and bless you, heal you, and cast devils out of you, and bestow blessings upon you, everyone's going to love me. But what does the Bible say? So I'm identifying with Jesus as a high priest. Well, I got to identify him with the apostle. I got to, I got to uh, walk a life where I am rejected of men. I am despised. Again. I don't go out there, I'm not supposed to go out there and provoke people until I get rejected and make all that happen. I'm not trying to make myself be rejected, but it is part of the, of the walk. So are you willing to be uh, identified with his death? 
Are you willing to be the saver of death unto death and then that perish? Because you know they're going to be offended. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own because you are not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. This is what happens to us as we perfect our testimony. This, this scripture comes to pass you know, in degrees, in increasing measure. Remember the word I said unto you, the servant's not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. And remember, even with the manifestations of healings and deliverances, a lot of people hated Jesus. Jesus cast the devil out of that guy. Was it the legion? I don't remember. And they said, let us go into the pigs. Yeah. Let's go into the swine. Right. Jesus said, okay, go ahead, go, go into the swine. Right. So they went into the swine, and the swine all ran, ran violently down a steep cliff and drowned in the sea. Yeah. So then they, uh, all the people came out, of, and they saw what happened, and rather than glorify God for the deliverance, they just said, hey, you, you get out of here. We don't want you around. You, know, you kill all our pigs. Get out. So all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me, hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin, but now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. First John three eleven to 13 This is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. If you suffer with him, you will reign with him. You will be glorified with him. There's a twofold consideration here, as Hebrews says, the apostle and the high priest. The apostleship was the state Jesus was in as a man on earth, and in that state he was despised, rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, he, that's where he was uh, crucified, hated. Consider that. Don't stop there. Consider that. And then consider the high priest. Consider how exalted he is. Consider the reward God gave him. But well, that's your strength to endure the sufferings. The joy of the Lord. The joy of glorification set before you. The hope of glorification set before you is your strength to endure. I mean, we have to really... Uh, put all our eggs in one basket. We got to go all in on Christianity, right? You have to forsake all you have. It's a, and it's something that you can't neglect. So I'm going to get back to the idea of neglect and s illustrate that again with scriptures that we already know. And again, these are the things we know, but we're transformed by the uh, renewing of our minds. Uh, we cannot, as I said before, we cannot change our hearts. God operates on our hearts by taking us through various experiences and so on and we have faith we have faith in the operation of God we are on we're in a on an operating table as it were in this life and God's operating on us and God is going to write his laws on our hearts and we don't know our hearts we can't change our hearts but we, we there is something we are aware of that we are conscious of that is an exercise that God has given to us, and that is in our spirit of our mind. So you transform by the renewing of your mind. You take every thought captive. In other words, deliberately examine how you're thinking. You take e look at each one and say, I'm, I'm taking it captive. Does this line up with a uh, scriptural principle? Is this the right attitude as a Christian? Is this, uh, is this me complaining? Or is this righteous indignation? Is this, uh, you know, am I being grateful and thankful? Am I eating and drinking my sufferings properly, worthily? As I said last week, we were talking about um, the two Canadian pastors, and I never got to finish that, so I think I'll finish it this week. The two Canadian pastors who were suffering persecution for righteousness' sake, and we we're talking about the righteous way, the way to righteously respond to persecution. And we're emphasizing what the Bible says. Don't resist evil. Don't render evil for evil. Railing for railing. Don't take vengeance. Don't strike back. Don't revile back. Don't shoot back. Don't swing the sword back. Peter, put up your sword. I say to you, resist not 
evil. We are lambs. We are lambs. And uh, Jesus didn't do any of that, but he committed himself to God who is able to judge righteously. And let them that suffer according to the will of God commit their souls unto him as unto a faithful creator who is able to save you and keep you, vindicate you. He can take the vengeance. He can do all that. But you see, um, and then I use the example, the very par parallel patterns of Paul before the high priest, who, which high priest commanded Paul to be struck in the face. And then what did Paul do? Well, he reviled. God will smite you, you white wall. You religious pervert. And maybe he said, what did he say? The Bible says he said, thou whited wall. You know, if it were any of us today, you know, what would we call him? You, you religious spiritual pig. Right? It was just an insult. Oh, revilest thou God's high priest? And Paul said, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was God's high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Paul had to back off, regroup himself, gird himself, walk himself back from his improper reaction. God didn't want him insulting the high priest. Right? And then, but Jesus did the same thing. He was before the high priest. Now, Jesus didn't yield. He didn't compromise. But when the high priest had Jesus smitten across the face, Jesus simply said, if I've, brought, if I've done evil, bear witness of the evil. But if I've done good, why, why did you hit me? Strategically, wisely, making them consider in their own conscience what they're doing. It's not a reviling. It's an application of wisdom. And as then we went on to say, you're going to be brought before rulers and kings for my, my sake, for a testimony. And I'm going to let that happen. They're going to bring you before governors and kings and judges and everything. And I, I'm letting this happen so that you can be a witness against them. Oh, so you can even speak. There's a way that in the wisdom of God, you can imply and speak that what they're doing is wrong. You can speak against them, but you're not reviling. You're not striking back. You're not pulling the gun. Because we all call kinds of things like, yeah, they come after my family with a gun. I'm going to take out my gun and I'm, I'm going to shoot them. Well, this is eye for eye and tooth for tooth. People who think like that, their, their mentality is back in Old Testament. As a matter of fact, I know groups of, of Christians or people who are professing Christianity and they have an inordinate, excessive uh, affection for Old Testament law and Torah and Old Testament stuff. And, and because of that, their natural inclination is to be, get ready to have a gun so they can fight back, shoot back. And I'm saying, the Bible says, tells us not to do that. Peter did it. He took up the sword. No, Peter put it in. Put that in. Put that sword in its sheath. So we have the pastor in, uh, the Polish pastor in Canada who, uh, because they broke the COVID restrictions, the Canadian police came and dragged him out. And, and they, he, he refused to be taken away and they had to kind of drag him along the highway as he resisted. And he was shouting all kinds of things like, you bunch of commie Nazis. And uh, I mean, nothing profane or anything. He was clearly the man's provoked. And as I said before, I believe if, if they talked to him, he, he, had seen, he had seen this kind of thing in Poland. Sure. And he never expected to see it here. So he was very provoked. And as I said before, I'm not even finding fault with the man. I'm just pointing out that, uh, that um, he, he is being persecuted for righteousness sake, but he's not doing it perfectly. Remember I said that if you eat and drink the Passover otherwise than it's written, uh, and you are eating and drinking the Passover or taking persecution uh, and you're, you're doing it even though you haven't been fully cleansed yet. Maybe there's still a bit of an issue, angry issue or something that's making you strike back or revile back. That's in Second Chronicles 29 and 30. The King Hezekiah said, if you're doing that, well, the good Lord pardon you. Even though you're taking that Passover, that cup of sufferings, in a little bit of impurity, you haven't been fully purified. Well, may God pardon you because you have set your heart to seek the Lord God of your fathers. So, okay, so I cut this guy. I'm saying he didn't respond perfectly, but I'm cutting him slack. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not finding fault with it. Don't say I am, because I'm saying he's at a point in his Christian development. He was provoked and he struck back. Yeah. I say the good Lord pardon him. He's still legitimately, legitimately suffering persecution sure. for righteousness' sake. May God reward him for that. But then we see another man who was a Pentecostal man who... The same thing, very similar thing happened to him. And what he did is he said, okay, he, he, he told his flock, okay, they want us to leave the church. Come on, let's all go. And he led his flock out of the church. He didn't resist them. He did what the police wanted. The police came, changed all the locks so they couldn't get back in their own church. And then while they were outside, he began preaching to the policemen. 
And he said, no, Jesus Christ came to save you from your sins too, sir. Sir, we have nothing against you. You're just a policeman here, and uh, you know, carrying out your orders. And, and if you had seen him, and I saw him, they had a video of him standing out there preaching to the policeman. Wonderful. And he did it, as far as I could tell, he executed it perfectly and in the perfection of, of the Spirit of Christ. Didn't insult him, didn't fight back, and yet stood his ground. Right. Didn't compromise anything about Christianity right. and about how what, what this what going on was not right. So this is what I mean. That's that, I want to finish that off because I, I, I started that and I never finished it. But let's go back to the um, idea of, of neglect. And this is nothing new. Okay, I'll go to Matthew 22. And this is an interesting concept or precept about men and the behavior of men in reference to the things of God. All right. Jesus answered and spake unto them by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for a son. And that's the second coming of the Lord. We're going to be mar- It's going to be consummated with the church. It's going to meet the Lord in the air. That's the consummation of this marriage of the Lord and the church, the bride. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Uh, Behold, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard their obvious wrath, and sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city, then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage." Well, the emphasis there is they, what? They made light of it. This is always an indictment against all of us, and it's something we need to renew our minds in all the time, uh, because this is just the, the tendency uh, that we have as Christians. Again, I'll make reference to the, uh, the ten virgins in Matthew 25. Five were wise, five were foolish. The foolish took their lamps, took no oil. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. How many slumbered and slept? How many lingered? How many neglected? All of them did. But now five have oil and five don't. Five are extremely spiritually minded regardless of their neglect. Their their hearts are set. They know that they have to forsake and abandon the things of this life. They know that life is... Christianity is not a service to humanity. Right? It's not. It's not a good works program. It's. It's not. Uh, I'll, I'll get to some stuff maybe in a, in a minute or two. And then at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. And the wise answered, No, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, I verily I say unto you, I know you not. So it's just the emphasis of promoting godly, godly fear. Godly fear always keeps us in a certain degree of urgency, attentiveness to the eternal purpose of God, uh, keeps us in in, in touch with uh, the temporality of this life, so that we do not exaggerate the importance of accomplishing things in this life or pursuing things in this life. Renewed in the spirit of our minds about the purpose of all of this. It's to prepare to meet God. Yeah, we don't have enough oil. I don't have enough motivation, strength, ambition, uh, and uh, motivation to do what I need to do to work out my salvation and whatever you want me to do. So we all have some decisions to make on, on this front. But anyway, you see how they all, they all slumbered and slept. All of them. Now Luke 14 is another account, which I'm going to make a particular point about that. It's the same as Matthew, or similar to Matthew 22. A certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, well, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. 
So the servant came and showed his lord these things, and the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the, hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. And there's still, there's still room, and so the Lord says, Go into the highways and hedges, compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. And then he gives the warning and the admonition right after that. If any man come to me and hate not father, mother, wife, children, brethren, sisters, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? So it's, again, it's putting our, us in touch in our consciences with the fear of God, the severity, the gravity, the necessity of, of really applying ourselves to this and not neglecting. And the whole thing is that they, with one consent, began to make excuse. Now the Bible said about you know Satan when they said to Jesus that by Satan, the, by the by Beelzebub he casts out devil and devils, and Jesus says, well, if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided. His kingdom can't stand, right? And the world, the whole world lies in wickedness. The, the world isn't unified. The world is divided. The world is always somehow fighting, conflicting. The world can never achieve true unity. The world's divided. Yet somehow, when God makes this call to, to salvation, or anything concerning the things of salvation, or purity, or godliness, or the things concerning Jesus Christ, oh, they all come together with this strange sort of unity. One consent. They all have the same consent. Oh, no, no, we can't do that. We're too busy in life doing this and that. And that. Oh, yeah, you can, be, yeah, you can have too much religion. You know, that's like, you, know, you don't want to get carried away with that stuff. Like, you don't want to get fanatical. You might end up in a cult. You know, and, and the whole world is in one consent about that, basically. If they can't be in consent about anything, they're in consent about that. And how about Jesus' uh, crucifixion? The whole crowd was crying. The whole crowd, crucify him, crucify him. The same day, Pilate and Herod became friends. For up until that time, they had been enemies. So you see people in the world who are enemies. Oh, they'll suddenly join hands and become friends if it's against Christ. Or if it's to make excuse why they shouldn't pay, pay that much attention to the call of salvation or the things of God. So that's Luke 14. And then we have Lot, Genesis 19. We know Lot was Abraham's nephew and Abraham's a type of the father and Lot is a type of us. You know, Lot vexed his righteous soul when he was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And just to summarize, and you all know how I do this, it's probably old, old, old hat for you all, but um, the strife between Abraham and Lot's herdsmen. And Abraham says, let there no strife, I pray thee, be between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. There's, look at all the land here. If, if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. You know, let's separate and get rid of the strife. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. Amen. Lot lifts up his eyes towards Sodom, sees the land's all well watered, like lots of provisions for this life, right. well, like, like, like uh, the garden. And, and he pitched his tent towards Sodom. He pitched his tent towards them. them. And if we apply the allegories and the types, the tent is our bodies, our, our physical structure here and our minds our 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 uh, bodies we're we're the tents of the holy ghost we're the house of god in other words remember the feast of tabernacles they would pitch tents behold the tabernacle of god is with men we are the tent we are the house we are the temple we are the altar the flesh he pitched his tent towards sodom he oriented his fleshly life uh his fleshly um life actions he oriented them towards worldly things in other words, he started thinking like the world. He started to develop worldly ambitions, worldly pursuits, worldly, worldly things. He pitched his tent, just started orienting his thinking like the world, pitching his tent towards worldliness. So what happens after a little while? Where does Lot end up? Right in Sodom and Gomorrah. And I know, I, know, I see this play out with certain Christians I know that are um, you know, backslidden, not, not walking to, according to what they've been uh, what they've learned in the past, I've watched them start getting worldly ways of thinking and to, to the point where we see them, they're right in Sodom, as it were. Yeah, I, I've seen it come to pass. I've watched it. I've, I've observed it. Well, that's Lot. Well, it's still Lot. You know, the Lord can deliver them out of Sodom and Gomorrah if they belong to the Lord. The Lord can keep them that are His. The Lord knew how to keep uh, Lot. But 
the angels come and say, hey, up, get you out of this place. The Lord is going to destroy it. And get up and get out. What you have here, sons, wives, whatever, get them all together and get out. And then while Lot, what, what did Lot do? While Lot lingered. While Lot lingered. That means while he hesitated, while he was reluctant. Kind of, I have to think this over. Sort of hesitation. While he delayed. While he uh, neglected. <laughs> so I'm just saying, we are characteristically like that. And that's why we got to talk about this stuff. Now I'll cut everybody some slack who is a Christian. Lot was saved. But look at what had to happen. He had to go through some dramatic experiences with the uh, perverted people of Sodom. And then the angels, being God being merciful to him, had to take a couple of angels and then almost drag him out. Okay. How shall we escape? Now, I'm going to start introducing an idea here to, um, to put the Scripture in Hebrews in a little more context. Chapter 2. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? So we give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard about working out our salvation, lest at any time we let them slip, or we neglect, or we linger, or we kind of put it on the back burner. Or lose our sense of urgency. You see why I promote the uh, assembling of yourselves together? And people think they don't need preaching? Uh, we're talking, but hey, I, we need preaching. I need preaching. If, if, we don't, if we don't deliberately get together and emphasize these things over and over again, we will linger. We will fall. We will slip. We will backslide. We will fall into, we'll pitch our tents towards Sodom, and the next thing you know, we'll be in Sodom. As I said before, what, what takes God so long to do something? It doesn't take God long to do anything. God's waiting for us to get sanctified, separated. We're the hang-up, not God. Exactly. We're lingering, slumbering, sleeping, neglecting, occupied, dull, dulls us down to the things of God. This is a, You need a constant assembling together, a constant submitting yourself to anointed preaching over and over again to keep that zeal and that urgency alive, promoted, supported, supported in the spirit of your mind, renewing it, renewing it, renewing it. It's not good enough that we've heard it and we know it and we have comprehended it and that's all, it's all over. No, even though you know it, you've heard it and you've comprehended it, you need to have it renewed, 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 bolstered up, re-energized, quickened up, given more prominence in your conscience so that you act, uh, you're more likely to act upon those things. And that's what the ministry is for, is for the perfection of the saints. And he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the saints, for the perfecting of the saints. So we all come to the unity of the, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness, unto, the, unto a perfect man. That's what, what ministering is for. And I heard something interesting on uh, the radio. I don't know if it was the St. George station or it was BBN, but it's a very, very good statement. It, it, of course, I clued into it because it was a preacher talking about the importance of assembling yourselves, which I've been harping on that for a long time. Uh, and he said, look in the New Testament at any saint that Paul named. You know, because sometimes at the end of the epistle, Paul will name a number of saints and say, greet Priscilla and Aquila and greet this one and say to this one and tell this one to bring the cloak. And, what, and he'll identify certain Christians. There's not a single Christian ever identified in the New Testament that wasn't a part of a gathering together with an assembly of saints in that city. Not a single one was drifting off on their own. Not a single one. They were all part of a congregation with overseers and God, godly men over them. Every single one. It also is the exclamation point or to, to that um, principle. Hosea is the prophet that was uh, that married the whore, and God wanted to uh, set up a visual illustration through the life of a man of God to demonstrate what the people of God were doing to him. So he made a living allegory with this man of God, where the man of God represented God, and that was Hosea, and then 
he told him, go marry, go take a wife of whoredoms. I want you to go marry, take a wife of whoredoms. Uh, a wife who's going to go leave you and fool around on you because uh, uh, the people have committed whoredoms and departing from God. Right. Now, we, we have understanding and revelation of the mystery of God. God, hasn't, God doesn't have to do that in the New Testament, and He doesn't. Right. Now, in the New Testament, we understand that the marriage is a mystery of Christ and the church. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of the woman. Right. And then the, the marriage becomes, you know, like the woman represents the bride. The man represents Christ in the marriage. So it's a living, it's another living allegory. Right. So as the church is subject to Christ, so the woman is subject to the man. And you go on and on and on. It's a living allegory. That's why there is no polygamy in the New Testament. Uh, and I'll just say it. I, he, Pastor Dowell says, well, do people think that the epistles of Paul trump the, uh, the law of the Old Testament? No, he says, it doesn't. And I tell you exactly, yes, it does. Everything in the New Testament trumps the Old Testament. Jesus says, oh, you heard them say of, you, you've heard them say of old time, thou shalt not. But now I say to you, now I'm going to say something to you that trumps the Old Testament. Everything Jesus said, everything Paul said, trumps what's in the Old Testament. Okay, I'm going to make that very emphatically clear. Because too many people are misappropriating the stories of the Old Testament and saying that they can superimpose them into the New Testament and live them out just like they were in the Old Testament. In other words, oh, I'm a man of God. Since David had lots of wives and concubines, I'm a man of God and I can have lots of wives and concubines. No, you can't. That was Old Testament. <laughs> it was a different dispensation. The truth of God, the, the, the fullness of His eternal purpose had not been revealed. They were in a great degree of ignorance. God let a lot of things pass. He allowed a lot of things, did a lot of things, that He does not allow for the New Testament. We have been given more, and more is required. Yes. And you can prove very plainly by the Scriptures Amen. what the marriage is about. And that there is no such thing as... Jesus said, hey, never mind the law. What was it like in the beginning? Moses said we could write a divorce, bill of divorce. What do you say? Well, from the beginning, listen, I'm here to tell you that we're going to strive and our goal is to go back to the way it was in the beginning. A man leaves father and mother, please to a woman. You know, Paul said it. Let every man have his own wife. Let every wife have her own husband. So that's the end of the issue. So don't anybody say that, oh, I'm like Hosea so I can go marry a whore for a wife. Well, whatever. Or we're not promoting any of that. But back in that time, God did set up the allegory. Hosea married the whore. Go take a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So we talk about this spirit of whoredoms. Well, what's the general characteristic of, uh, of whoredoms is unfaithfulness. Right. Yeah. Not faithful to the plan of God. Not faithful to the purpose of God. To the will of God. And by and large, the organized churches are whorish. It's a spirit of... Jezebel. It's a spiritually unfaithful to the purity of God, to the holiness of God. They're compromised. They want to be a savor of life to everybody. They want to be honorable to everybody all the time, every time. And God says, no, you've got to also be despised, rejected. Oh, well, if we say this, we'll lose half our congregation. Well, lose half your congregation. There's lots of things that alienated people from following Jesus. Chiefly, John 6:66, 6, as we said last week, which has all to do with walking in the sufferings. As soon as Christians find out that you have to suffer, uh, they don't they don't want to be on board anymore. Oh, we can't do that, right? And, and there's a whole structure and motivation and the pursuit of of the religious organizations that l at large are are highly money more money motivated. And uh, let's see if I can get into this. So I'm just cueing you into the idea of a spirit of whoredoms. Okay, um, let me read a few scriptures here. My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them, for the spirit of whoredoms have caused them to err, and they have gone a whoring from under their God. They will not frame their doings to turn to, unto their God, for the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them, and they have not known the Lord. Hosea 4.11, whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. Spiritual whoredom takes away the heart to prepare to enter his sufferings, basically. Uh, I don't know how far I can go with this. Um, there are certain pursuits and characteristics of the spirit of whoredoms that's similar in many of the churches that are out there today. Uh, when, we, when I talk about the very, very first principles, simple principles 
of sanctification and the church's identity. Uh, there's no name given under him heaven whereby we must be saved. The church of Jesus Christ, Ephesians says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So we have a name. Jesus says, I have come in my Father's name. You won't receive me. Now if any man came in his own name, him you will receive. You won't receive me because I came in my Father's name. Okay, so if we come and we say, well, identify ourselves, well, what church are you? We're the church of Jesus Christ. Oh, of Latter-day Saints? No. Oh, uh, of the apostolic faith? No. No such thing. The church has a name. The church has an identity. It's singular. It's simple. <laughs> it's sanctified. It's exclusive. It's Jesus Christ. That's all. That's our only identity. Well, doesn't that seem like a simple idea? Well, go insist that the church only be identified as the church of Jesus Christ. Now, people will receive you as some kind of spiritual thing if you're Pentecostal, Episcopal, Catholic, whatever. Right? Lutheran, Wesleyan, coming in all those other names. Does the world receive them? The world receives them. The government recognizes them as religious institutions. Even the Catholic Church considers them somewhat religious institutions. So much so that they're trying to get them to all come back on board with the Catholic Church. But if you do something as simple as say, well, the church is Jesus Christ, and that's it. That's our, that's our identity. You see, now Jesus said, then you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to offend people. Because by implication, you're excluding all that stuff out there. Babylon, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Babylon, mother of harlots. Roman Catholic Church, Babylon. Roman Catholic Church in 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea and the Roman uh, government blending pagan Babylonish worship and idolatry, blending it in with the elements of Christianity to make a universal religion to control the masses, thus polluting and perverting and blending perversion into the Christian way and corrupting it. The birth of the Catholic Church, Babylon, mother of harlots. And then all the denominational churches sprung out of Babylon. And for the most part, Starting with the Reformation, Luther, you know, Luther came out of Rome. And, and so whenever we talk about this kind of church history, I'm, I'm not speaking against Luther as an individual. I don't, think, I don't think Luther had anything to do with men taking his work and organizing a church and calling it Lutheran. I don't think he would have advocated for that at all. So the man may have been quite uh, in his integrity and in everything God gave him to do, but what happened? Men corrupted it. Men corrupted it and turned it into an organization with another name, another identity other than Jesus. Remember I was saying in Psalm 105 or 6 or whatever, they took the glory of God and changed it into the similitude of an ox that eats grass. And Paul says, don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. And when Paul, said, don't, when Paul says, don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, he's pointing out that the oxen is an allegory for the preacher. The preacher is treading out the corn, the seed. He's treading it out. Paul considers himself one of the oxen treading out the word of God. It's an allegory. Because he says, does God care for oxen? No, he doesn't care for oxen. He's saying it as an allegory for our sake. Paul's saying, don't muzzle me. Let me speak, let me speak the word of God with free course, because I'm treading out the corn. Don't muzzle me. So Martin Luther was an ox. He was treading out corn. The just shall live by faith. You're not saved by works. You're saved by grace. Very, very important plank of doctrine in the restoration of the true counsel of God for our generation began with Luther. Very important, very vital, and very true. And that's what God gave them. So, so what did they do? They took the glory of God and they made it, turned it into the, an ox, the similitude of an ox, a man, in other words, a man of God. And they turned the glory into Luther's glory, Lutheran church. See, none of that is scripturally sound. So any man comes in his own name, him you'll receive. You won't receive me because I've come in my Father's name. It's one of the most first fundamental basic aspects of identity for the Christian and uh, sanctifying yourself and only taking the identity of the name of Jesus that is very simple in its perception but has far-reaching implications against a lot of other religious things out there. You understand? That's why people don't, don't, don't like that. Ultimately, I think there are people out there that God will call out of the churches and there's people out there that, uh, that are sincerely seeking after God, but you take any other identity, 
And you're missing that most simple first principle of sanctification and identity in the body of Christ. And it's the beginning of, of whoredoms. Now, the spirit of whoredoms is what's going to cause us to err. The spirit of whoredom is going to take away our heart for suffering. It's going to take away our willingness to suffer reproach and rejection for the witness of Jesus. Uh, and here's what my observation in the denominational groups I was in. I was in one of the churches, the UPC, and I was in some other non-denominational charismatic types of uh, groups and so on and so forth. Something that's common, but they commonly, uh, they are motivated and, and their, their perception is one that they think that anybody can be saved. They pursue outreaches and church programs and crusades and that sort of thing. It's kind of like, get the message out, try to get as many people saved as possible. All right, now, here's the thing. We have various principles, and I'm not against utterance, and I'm not against outreach per se, uh, but um, what happens is the perception of those things violates absolutes that are part of the true doctrine of Christ. I'm going to try to say this kind of off the cuff, and I've said it before. Um, God made man with will, and for a man to exercise his will is the very essence of worship. And God is not... Uh, the intention of God is not to impose or force the exercise of a man's will because worship would lose its meaning, right? You know, it would be like uh, me. Uh, I would love Christopher to say, hey, you know, Jonathan, I love and accept you and receive you as a brother. And if he did that out of his own heart just because he, he j just came into his heart to do it, then that would be meaningful to me, right? If I force the issue and I point a gun at his hand and said, you better tell me that, you're, that you love me as a brother, man, or I'm going to... Yeah, he he could say he could say it, but it wouldn't have any meaning, right? Well, I mean, it's kind of a simple idea, but so God isn't in the business of, of forcing the will like that, coercion, because that's the whole platform for worship, exactly. So um, the Bible talks about the will of man, and there's the things about the will. Now, in the eternal purpose of God, is God all knowing? Is God all powerful? Okay. Now, would everybody say that with knowledge there is power? Yeah, with certain knowledge there is power. He said to Peter, Behold, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is loose on earth. Whatever you bind on heaven is loose in heaven. I give you the keys. I give you power. Uh, behold unto you, lawyers, you withhold the keys of knowledge. So what are the keys? The keys are the knowledge of God. So there is, to an extent, power in knowledge. So who has all knowledge? Okay, God. Who has all power? God. So now, if, I, if there's something that I, as a man... No, that God doesn't. No, if, if, if you don't know anything about plumbing, and I know all kinds of things about plumbing, who has more power as a plumber? I do, right? Now, if there's something that God isn't sure about or God doesn't really know, but I know, who, who, who is the more powerful one by definition of knowledge? I am, right? Well, here's, and that's blasphemous. That's blasphemous. What I'm saying is that in the eternal purpose of God, God foreknew. God predestinated. God knew before the foundation of the world who is going to be saved, who will not be saved. He established it. He defined it. He predetermined it. He ordained it. And He made the decision before you were ever born. We're not born by blood. In other words, I'm not born because I'm a natural Jew. I'm not born of God. I'm not born again because uh, of the will of the flesh. I'm not born again because, or I uh, know God because I... My flesh wanted to so badly and I tried so hard to get saved and bless God, I finally got what I wanted. No, brother, I didn't I want nothing to do with God. I didn't have any ambition to be saved. I didn't have any ambition to be a teacher or anything else. That was God's decision. You have not chosen me, God said. You did not choose me. I chose you. I'm the one. Salvation is of the Lord. You're only saved because God decided you for yes. you to be saved. That's right. Amen. His power to save you transcends your will. But people think that people think that anybody is fair game to be saved. All they have to do is choose to. So let's reach out and try to get as many people saved as possible. That is a component of the spirit of whoredom. It gets you on a quest to try to get people saved distracted on getting a whole bunch of people saved that God does not necessarily want to get saved. As I said before, the pattern is the days of Noah. As the days of coming of the Son of Man, so was the days of the coming uh, as it was in the days of Noah. 
God told Noah, here's who I'm saving. The rest I'm destroying. Don't try to get them saved. You come out. Separate yourself from the world. Build this ark. Perfect this church. Come out. Prepare to meet God. Now, if you do that, God will draw to you the people that He has chosen. Amen. And as you go out in your daily life, you'll, you'll run into people and you'll strike up a conversation about the Lord and some of them will go nowhere and some of them will draw, draw in. But as an organization, there shouldn't be a, a, a pronounced, deliberate intention to try to think that we got to outreach and convince as many people to change their minds. Because it becomes a distraction from building the ark. So what happens then is they begin to compromise holiness. They begin to do things like, uh, well, we need to get as many people saved as possible. And it's, they think it's some kind of free-for-all or some kind of lottery. So we're not getting many people coming out to the church. So let's have a Christian rock music night because it will draw the young people. Well, what are you doing now? You're compromising the holiness of God. No, rock music is evil. It's an evil spirit. The spirit of the music is evil. You're bringing an evil spirit into the house of God, right? You're profaning the holiness. You're compromising. So we're not born of the will of flesh. We're not born of blood. We're not born because we decided to, because we tried so hard. We're born because we're born of God. Now, here's what I'm saying. God has spoken once. Twice have I heard this. Power belongeth unto God. The power of salvation is not in the will of man. Even though God gives you the experiences of choosing, it's God that causes your will to choose one way or another. He will let your will be influenced by external circumstances and afflictions and certain things. that will kind of steer your will, convince you to choose one way or another the way He wants you to. But it's still your will. He's not superimposing on it. If if salvation were simply whether man decides to or not, like if salvation were some issue where God says, well, I'll just make all these men with their free wills, I'll sit back, I'm not sure which ones are going to choose me or not, we'll see what happens. Well, that's something, now all of a sudden now God doesn't know something. He doesn't have all the power. You see this, like the most basic characteristics of defining the character of God in terms of his all-knowing and this is all-powerfulness, so you can't ascribe salvation to the power of men exercising their will. Well, the, the, the churches will say, well, the Bible says, whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. But it also says, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you. It also says, it's God works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. It also says, oh, here's this field. Uh, uh, a man planted good seed in his field and another man came and sold bad seed, tares. Well, he that sowed the good seed is God. He put people into the world that from the beginning he knew had the characteristics and the, the substance in them that would want to get saved. Because he decided that before, before you were born. And then who, who put the other people into the world? An enemy did this. The devil sowed them. The wheat and the tares. God sowed the good seed. The devil sowed the tares. Uh, do we believe the Bible or not? Of course, everything I say is predicated on the fact that the King James Bible is a, le a legitimate source and, and, and accurate for expounding the purpose of God. So if you don't believe the King James Version of the Bible, admittedly, I have nothing to stand on. <laughs> I can't prove it archaeologically or historically or anything. But uh, the whole thing there is that uh, it's, it's not the will of man that has the power to be saved. It's, it's God that chooses. So you have to acknowledge then there's people in the world that the devil planted that were not born to be saved, right? That that's, can be a hard pill to swallow, I guess. So the, the basic thing here is that uh, that sort of mindset that prevails in a lot of denominational churches, outreaches and so forth, it's predicated on an idea, an attitude, that it is in the power of a man's will to be saved or not. And that is that, that violates a more absolute description of God's character. See, that's a blasphemy against God, actually. Because nothing takes God by surprise. It's an, all power belongs to God, so therefore it's impossible. The most absolute important principle here is the characteristic of God that He has all power, He has all knowledge. You can't change that. All the rest of your doctrine has to fit in with that. Okay. So if, if, if salvation were some sort of crapshoot, let's see if they decide to or not. 
That means there's something God doesn't know yet. And that means somehow the power of salvation has been given to the will of man and not it's no longer in the hands of God. So you see, it's fundamentally blasphemous. So you, we, sh we should change our way of thinking about that concerning God's eternal purpose. God chooses, God draws, God causes you to will and do His good pleasure. Yes, we do have an exercise of will. Yes, so there's decisions that we have to make. And if we're not making them right and we're the people that God wants to be saved, He'll just put trouble in our life until we choose for what is the best for us. You, you know, and my, my simple allegory is the allegory of the ants. Ant on the table, you know, I'm, I'll say it again. Uh, let's put an ant on the floor and put a wall here and a wall there. And the ant could go for the sugar on that side or the crumbs, breadcrumbs on this side. And the ant makes a decision, I'm going to go for the breadcrumbs. But I am like God to that ant. I'm a higher creature. I can see more than that, what that ant can see. And the ant can have his free will and decide where he wants to go. But yet I have more power and influence and I can, I can make that ant choose things. And he doesn't even know that I'm influencing him. So the ant says, I want the breadcrumbs this way. And I decide, no, I want that ant to eat the sugar over there. So I'll just put a big wall up so that the ant can't... You know, then the ant comes to this wall... And the ant says, oh, I think, I'll, I think I'll decide to go over there and get the sugar instead. I can't get past this wall. The ant, doesn't, the ant just thinks he's making up his mind, right? The ant is exercising its will. But what good is the exercise of the ant's will? If I am a bigger, larger creature, I have more resources, more power, more influence, more perception, I can make the ant do whatever I want. Absolutely. Now, let's say the ant gets really stubborn and says, oh, there's a wall. I'll, I'll invent a, an airplane and fly over it or something. <laughs> a little miniature airplane. Well, I'll just take a big bowl and I'll put it over over the wall. And the poor ant's airplane will hit the wall and he'll crash. And I'll say, boy, that didn't work either. Maybe I will go over and get the sugar. And then I say, okay, so now the ant's doing what I want. I can take the bowl away and let the ant go get the sugar. You understand, this is the way God works. God works in you to will and to do. You wouldn't choose to be saved unless God afflicted you and put an influence in your life to cause you. Blessed is the man who God chooses and causes to approach. Puts influences in your life that make you decide to change your course. Make you decide to do this instead of that. Yeah, you're still exercising your will. God's letting you have the experience of exercising your will. But people make the mistake of calling the will free. God, God has given a man free will. Well, and I try to clarify that. He's given you an exercise of will. He lets you freely exercise your will. But it's not really free because... It's either being manipulated by Christ or Antichrist. It's being guided. The mystery of iniquity is, is either uh, subtly influencing you to choose evil things or God subtly influencing you to choose, choose righteous things. You're still choosing. Don't stop choosing. Don't stop exercising your will. But don't think that salvation is in the power of the will of man. God already knows who's His. He's decided it from the foundation of the world. Uh, he said, these Pharisees... He said, leave them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Proverbs says that the whore is a deep ditch. Not just the physical whore, but the spiritual whore. So what happens is, through this uh, um, inordinate affection, this exaggerated focus on trying to win as many people as possible by getting them all to change their minds by their own efforts and their own programs, they abandon the purpose of God. They start compromising, you see. They start becoming unfaithful to the virtue, the purity, the holiness, the sanctification. The real purpose of God is the eternal purpose of God is to find out who God has chosen. Let's get together. Let's God, let God draw us together. And let's perfect our holiness. Let's get ready to meet God. Nothing, nothing's going to last in this life. We don't, we're not supposed to value anything in this life. We're supposed to forsake all of that. Now, the Bible teaches, you know, repentance from dead works. And so a lot of those things are dead works. When I was in the UPC, they would have programs to try to draw people. They've had special services. Christmas for Christ. Well, Christmas for Christ, well, we know Christmas is pagan. Yeah. Well, if you, it's very simple. You worship God, you worship Him in spirit and truth. And no lies of the truth, right? Whoever loves and makes a lie has their part in. Well, is Christmas the truth? Is Santa Claus the truth? Why do you want to blend it in with Christianity? Christianity is all about sanctification. Separate the pollution from it and purify God. You have to worship Him in spirit 
and in truth. Otherwise, you worship in vain. So the Knights of Columbus, when I was living in Pembroke, they had a billboard, and I guess that's a saying that goes goes on all over. They say, uh, "Keep Christ in Christmas." And they're trying to take a pagan Christmas uh, celebration and trying to purify it by keeping Christ in it. And really, no, no, get them out of there <laughs> because Christmas is pagan. It's all about winter solstice and worshiping of the sun, S-U-N. Rudolph. And uh, we know Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Okay, Santa Claus. Santa Claus is the blasphemy of God. Santa Claus, why? He knows everything, right? He knows if you've been bad or good. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. Those are the attributes of God. God isn't a fat old guy with a white beard and glasses. <laughs> fat, fat fella up there getting ready to give everybody a bunch of toys. Little kids' toys. It's, it's, a, it's a fable. It's a lie. It's a... It's a distraction from the true per, eternal purpose of God. You can't worship God like that. So there you go. And yet, the UPC will swear up and down, you know, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost, and you've got to speak in tongues, and you've got to be baptized in Jesus' name, and we're apostolic, and we're tongue-talking, and we're spirit-filled, and we got the gifts of the Spirit, and blah, 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 blah. Now let's go worship Christmas. Let's have a Halloween service. No, don't have a Halloween service. Have nothing to do with that wicked thing. That's the devil's hallowed evening. Halloween is about witches and goblins and devils and oh, you know, we'll purify Halloween when we go out trick or treating. We'll dress up as angels instead of monsters. No, no, you can't clean up the perversion. You have to separate from it. Evil communications corrupt good manners. All these associations with worldly thinking. They're going to transgress. They're going to cause you to be unfaithful to the eternal purpose of God. That's why it's the spirit of whoredoms. That's why it's come out, come out of her, my people. That you be not partaker of her sins, so you don't receive of her plagues. You can't clean up the whore. The whore has to come out and sanctify. So it's the spirit of whoredoms will cause you to err. The spirit of whoredoms will cause you to believe that salvation is in the power of the will. Therefore, if I can convince someone to choose Jesus, yeah, I got them saved. And we used to say that. And you'd be saying, well, how many people have you got saved since you've been a Christian? Well, I've never got anybody saved and I never will. Only God saves them. We can give them the word of reconciliation on behalf as ambassadors to Christ. Be reconciled to God. We're not saving anybody. See, you're not born... You're born by the will of God. Everyone who's born is born because God made a decision that I'm going to save you. He made that decision before you were born. You had nothing to do with it. Absolutely. If you had something to do with it, yeah. then you could claim you had power to... Yeah. If, it was, if, it, if salvation is simply the power of a will of man to choose or not to choose, then we don't know who's going to be saved until the man makes the choice. Do you understand? Now, now God's not all-knowing. So he's not God. It's a blasphemous. See, all, all this stuff has to agree with what I'm saying. The, the doctrine that describes the absolutes of God, all-powerful, all-knowing, everything we think about Christianity has to line up with that, has to reconcile with it. Now, here's the thing. And here's a scripture I really like. One of my favorites is Paul. Paul says, uh, And now I follow after, if that I may apprehend... That for which I've app I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. It's kind of a, <laughs> a mumble jumble of words there. But it's interesting. You look at Paul's conversion. Was Paul aspiring to be a Christian? Did he have an ambition to be an apostle? It's like I say, did, did Peter pace the floors day and night saying, Oh, I've got this such a burden for the Gentiles. I want to go reach the Gentiles. Because Peter is the one who preached salvation to the Gentiles for, for, for the first at the first in Acts 10. No, he didn't do that. There's no ambition there. It's a work that God set up. And he just simply walked in the Spirit and walked into an unfolding of events. He didn't plan it. He didn't deliberate it. Right? He just had men show up at his door. I'm not going to rehearse the whole story. You know it. There's a man praying and he, he ha his prayers came up as a memorial before God and an angel said, uh, your prayers will come up for a memorial. Send for Simon and he'll tell you what to do. And the man sends his servants and they knock on Peter's door. And Peter has his vision of the sheet knit at the four corners with unclean animals. What God has cleansed, don't call on common or don't call common or unclean. Paul didn't even know what it meant. The man knocked at his door. 
The Spirit, the Spirit didn't say, okay, go with them because you're going to preach to the Gentiles and you're going to get Holy Ghost. Nope. Just says, go with the men. Don't ask. Don't doubt. Just go with them. You understand? It's Peter's will. There was no ambition to try to get him saved. It was just a work God was doing and Peter was walking in the course, just obeying the Spirit one little step at a time. Even Paul himself didn't realize what was going on until as he preaches and the Holy Ghost comes on him and they speak in tongues and he says, now I perceive. Now I get it. God's no respecter of persons. He's poured out the Holy Ghost on the Gentiles. So, a lot of dead works are deliberated, self-willed, conceived in the minds of men a lot of the time. God hath ordained us, prepared us unto good works that He has ordained that we should walk in them. So most of the good works we do, we don't dream them up, we don't deliberate them, we don't think of them, we don't plan on them. It's not a concerted, conscious effort to try to reach this particular group of people. It's, it's just God leading the events of our life and we get a sense God wants us to go here. And Oh, when we run into somebody and we, hate, we get a door of utterance. And it's kind of an unfolding. God sets up the work and we just participate in it. We don't come up with the work. He comes up with the work. We just learn how to participate with it. Follow it. Okay, and I'm talking about this in reference to the spirit of whoredoms. Because that's what we're being delivered. Spirit of whoredoms will deny these more important aspects of God's eternal purpose. Our focus is sanctifying, getting out of the world, getting the world's thinking, the world's spirit out of us, getting ready to meet God. We understand the, the deeper theology of God's eternal purpose, that Satan was the first one to exercise self-will in heaven. As soon as you exercise your will in independence from God, that constitutes a separation. Right? If, if, if we're walking together and we're brothers in simplicity, and I'm saying, well, you know, I'm the greater brother and you're the lesser brother and I would like you to follow me, so follow me and we're walking down the path and I say, okay, it's my will now that we turn left and then you turn right. Yeah. Is that togetherness or is that separation? See, Lucifer says, I will, separation. You exercise your will in any way in independence in eternity, separation. You'll be separated from God. So, as a necessity, as a necessity, our wills must be locked in agreement with the will of God eternally, perpetually, never stray, never be unfaithful to what God's will is. And we have to be in that state for eternity. It's essential that our hearts are prepared to arrive at that state before we die. Yeah. Or we can't enter eternal life. <laughs> Because there's a potential for us to exercise our will against God, independently of God, separate from God. It becomes a cancer, a poison in eternity that has to be ejected. All this stuff is because it has to be this way. It has to be this way. So the focus is not, let's get as many people saved. Let's outreach and see how many people we can get to make a decision for Christ. And that's the, where Billy Graham's... Uh, motto, if you will, the motto of his ministry or what he was known for, he, his magazine was called Decision Magazine. Salvation is not your decision. Now, you can make a decision, but you've got to understand God made the decision before you did. Now, let's get back to Paul. I follow if I may apprehend or obtain or reach after, pursue and get, if I may apprehend that for which I have been apprehended of Christ Jesus. Yes. So, Paul had no ambition to be an apostle. This is the characteristic of true Christians. This is the characteristic of true ministers. I didn't have an ambition to be a... Uh, I think God has given me a burden for the uh, aboriginal Australian tribes. No, I don't know any of that stuff. Paul had no ambition. What happened was Paul was struck down on the road to Damascus from a bright light, Jesus Christ himself. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Yeah. <laughs> well, Paul wasn't seeking the Lord. The Lord was seeking Paul. Paul didn't decide he wanted to be saved and become an apostle. Jesus decided he's going to become an apostle. Bingo. Paul wasn't out to apprehend Christ. Christ was out to apprehend Paul. Now, once Christ struck him down and apprehended him yes. and arrested him and subdued his yes. religious spirit and his persecution against the Christians, yes. took him aside and said, you are a chosen vessel. There you go. Now, now that I have apprehended you, now you apprehend me. Seek after me. And that's how it works. We don't seek God. God seeks us. We don't choose God. God chooses us. And when he chooses us, reveals himself to us, to us, reveals his purpose to us, 
Then he lets us go in the church and says, Now I've chosen you. I've chosen you to be a people that pursues me. Seek me out. Pursue your holiness. Prepare to meet God. Perfect it. Bring it to perfection. Follow on to know the Lord. And then we pursue Him. But our opportunity and our, uh, the instigation of our pursuing the Lord was only because He instigated it first. You understand? Amen. I'm trying to apprehend that for which Christ apprehended me for. But I couldn't even begin the pursuit unless He started it. And that puts it kind of in perspective. I didn't choose Him. He chose me. Yet after He chose me, here I am. Work out your salvation. Uh, take heed to the ministry that you received of the Lord, that you fulfill it. Well, and then that, how about you? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Find out what God called you to do, and we want to fulfill all that. And don't be negligent. He said that to Levites, I think. And now, my sons, be not negligent. For the Lord has chosen you to serve Him and, and all of that kind of stuff. All right. Kind of a fundamental description where fundamentally the spirit of whoredoms goes into error is they ascribe too much power to the will of men to be saved and it becomes a blasphemy against the absolute doctrinal truth that God has power God is doing this God has chosen every plant that my heavenly father has not planted shall be and thrown into the fire so you mean there's plants, there's people or plants? You know, you are the trees of righteousness. You are the planting of the Lord. We are the Lord's garden. We are His planting. The Lord has planted us. Every, every tree that my Father has not planted. So do you mean there's people out there in the world? God has not planted them? That's the implication. And that's the reality. Now, I don't know who all God's people are. And uh, the true people of God, it's... Uh, the devil doesn't even know. The devil didn't know where the real body of Christ was when it was born. When the Christ began to be manifested into the world, he knew, he knew about it. He didn't know who, who, where he was. So he just said, I'll take every, just everybody two years old and under, kill them, and I'll probably cover my, my tracks that way. Out. One of them's got to be the Christ. And that's the way the devil is. He, he's going to come after you. If you're a Christian, it'll probably come after you if you're even trying to be a Christian. Or if you're trying to be holy or virtuous or anything. Or moral. Okay, just remember to look at this thing in light of God's eternal purpose. This idea of, of the will of man. It has to be there so that there's worship. And yet, God cannot... He's got to give man the exercise of will, but He can't let man... Man's will have power over things. Otherwise, he's not God. And that's why we're chosen. And that's why salvation is not a bunch of programs and it's, it's not a lottery. It's not a roll of the dice. It's not that every person you meet, well, if he decides to get saved, everybody has a potential to be saved. Everybody does not have a potential to be saved. But only God knows. I don't know who those people are. But God will reveal it. And the Lord knows them that are His. And anyone that names the name of Jesus Christ, depart from iniquity selfishness, self-centeredness, whatever, self-pursuits. All right, I think I've said enough. I'm blessed. I'm done.